In the amino acids and protein structure tutorial, we talked about the chemistry of protein synthesis and folding. We differentiated between hydrophilic and hydrophobic amino acids based on their R groups. Because of the hydrophobic effect, which decreases hydrophobic surface area in order to maximize favorable interactions between hydrophilic molecules, we saw that proteins that exist in the watery environment of the cytoplasm have mostly hydrophilic amino acids on the surface, which can form favorable interactions with water and other hydrophilic molecules in the cytoplasm. Any hydrophobic amino acids are tucked into the interior of the protein, away from the cytoplasm. But as mentioned in the lipid bilayer tutorial, some proteins span membranes. Many ions and molecules cannot cross the hydrophobic lipid bilayer, and these molecules require a transport protein to allow them to pass. In this tutorial, we'll explore the chemistry of these transmembrane proteins, which must have distinct domains appropriate for the distinct environments of the extracellular space, the membrane interior, and the cytoplasm. We'll also look at the chemical principles that underlie the specificity of channel proteins. Transport proteins allow ions or molecules to pass from one side of a membrane to the other. As a result, transport proteins are transmembrane proteins. They span the membrane. Whereas the parts of proteins that exist in watery environments have hydrophilic surface amino acids, the parts of proteins that cross the lipid bilayer must have hydrophobic surface amino acids. The interior of the bilayer is made of hydrocarbon tails, which are uncharged, and any neighboring hydrophilic amino acids would not get a favorable plus-minus interaction with the bilayer. In order to embed in the membrane, these hydrophilic amino acids would have to break favorable interactions with fully or partially charged molecules of the cytoplasm. As a result, the part of a polypeptide that crosses the lipid bilayer has hydrophobic amino acids exposed to the surrounding hydrocarbon tails. These hydrophobic side chains don't have to forego any favorable interactions as they move out of water because they don't have charges. But what about the synthesis of these hydrophobic domains? Normally, protein synthesis occurs in the cytoplasm of the cell. But the cytoplasm is hydrophilic, and hydrophobic amino acids, shown here in red, don't form favorable interactions with the hydrophilic cytoplasm. This is especially true when there are many hydrophobic amino acids in a row, which force neighboring water molecules of the cytoplasm to forego favorable interactions. Here's where signal recognition particles, or SRPs, come in. They recognize a string of hydrophobic amino acids, bind to them, and bring them to the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum. Because they're hydrophobic, they embed in the hydrophobic membrane of the rough endoplasmic reticulum. This decreases the hydrophobic surface area that is exposed to the cytoplasm, which allows water and other hydrophilic molecules to interact favorably with each other instead of foregoing those favorable interactions to be next to uncharged side chains. But remember that for all amino acids, including hydrophobic amino acids, the atoms that make up the backbone of the side chain have partial charges. In this transmembrane segment, the hydrophobic side chains don't forego favorable interactions, but if exposed to the hydrophobic phospholipid tails, the partially charged atoms in the backbone would. To maximize stability and decrease free energy, these partial charges maximize favorable interactions with other partial charges. This can happen in a variety of ways depending on the structure of the protein. We'll look at two scenarios, single-pass transmembrane proteins, as found in receptor tyrosine kinases, and multi-pass transmembrane proteins, as found in ion channels. In single-pass transmembrane proteins, Favorable interactions between partially charged atoms of the backbone can be maximized by forming an alpha helix. The backbone, highlighted in blue, coils around so that hydrogen bonds can be formed between partially negative oxygen atoms and partially positive hydrogen atoms. These atoms belong to the backbone. Hydrophobic side chains, shown in green, project out into the hydrophobic phospholipid tails and all hydrophilic atoms of the backbone are tucked into the inside of the alpha helix, maximizing favorable interactions. Typically, this transmembrane alpha helix is 20 to 25 amino acids long, so that the length of the hydrophobic alpha helix is the same as the length of the hydrophobic section of the lipid bilayer. This is the form of the transmembrane section of each receptor tyrosine kinase in a dimer. 
Each RTK has an extracellular domain, a transmembrane domain, and an intracellular domain. Like proteins found in the cytoplasm, both the extracellular domain and the cytoplasmic domain have hydrophilic side chains exposed to the watery surroundings. The transmembrane domain is a single alpha helix, and the amino acids in that alpha helix have hydrophobic side chains. In multipass transmembrane proteins, multiple segments of the polypeptide chain pass through the membrane. For example, the non-gated potassium ion channel protein, which is involved both in cell transport and in neuron function, has eight transmembrane alpha helices. These eight alpha helices are arranged into a ring that forms the pore of the channel. Potassium is hydrophilic. It's a charged ion. In the extracellular space or in the cytoplasm, potassium forms favorable interactions with water molecules. We've seen these favorable interactions between water and sodium and chloride ions in previous tutorials. In order for potassium to enter the channel, it must forego those favorable interactions with partially negative oxygen atoms of water. Breaking these interactions is unfavorable, and the only way it'll happen is if potassium is able to exchange those interactions for other favorable interactions in the pore of the channel. This is exactly what happens. The inner lining of the channel is hydrophilic, and it can form favorable interactions with potassium ions. This includes the opening of the channel, as well as the sides of the alpha helices that form the lining of the pore. At the opening of the channel, potassium ions exchange favorable interactions with water molecules for favorable interactions with partially negative oxygen atoms of the protein. The opening of the channel has eight partially negative oxygen atoms that are all perfectly spaced to fit a potassium ion. I've only drawn four of them here. As a result, the process of exchanging interactions with water for interactions with the protein has a small activation energy. There's not much of an energy barrier for potassium to interact with the channel. So potassium will and does enter the channel quickly. These potassium channels are specific to potassium ions. It makes sense that negatively charged ions and hydrophobic molecules wouldn't enter the channel because they wouldn't interact favorably with the partially negative oxygen atoms of the protein. It also makes sense that large ions or molecules wouldn't enter the channel because they wouldn't fit through the pore. But the channel doesn't even let in sodium, another positively charged ion that is even smaller than potassium. The reason is because sodium is too small to interact with all eight of the partially negative oxygen atoms of the pore. As you can see on the periodic table, sodium is in the row above potassium, and sodium has one fewer electron shell than does potassium. So sodium is significantly smaller than potassium is. If sodium were to exchange interactions with water for interactions with the pore of the protein, it wouldn't get nearly as many favorable interactions with the protein as it did with water. The diameter of the potassium channel is too wide to fit the sodium ion. As a result, the process of a sodium ion moving from water to the pore of a channel has a high activation energy and thus does not happen at an appreciable rate. Once inside the channel, potassium forms favorable interactions with the sides of the alpha helices that line the channel. These transmembrane alpha helices have one face that is hydrophilic and can thus interact favorably with potassium. I've shown that schematically here. The dark purple indicates the sides of the alpha helices that have hydrophobic side chains and thus interact with the hydrophobic phospholipid tails. The light purple represents the sides of these alpha helices that have hydrophilic side chains and can thus interact favorably with potassium. Unlike single-pass transmembrane alpha helices, which have all hydrophobic side chains, alpha helices in potassium channels have one side that is hydrophobic and one side that is hydrophilic. As a result, the transmembrane domain of channel proteins is inverted relative to cytoplasmic proteins that we've looked at before. While proteins that exist in the watery environment of the cytoplasm have hydrophilic surfaces and hydrophobic interiors, transmembrane domains of channel proteins have hydrophobic surfaces and hydrophilic interiors.